This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Welcome, my name is Henry DeVries. I'm the Assistant Dean for UC San Diego Extension, and I'm the past president of the UCSD Alumni Association. So I wanna welcome you on behalf of the 150,000 members of the Alumni Association and the more than 56,000 enrollees at UCSD Extension. And we've got a great career boost camp for you today. The questions will be led by a journalist uh, from San Diego who's well known to many, the executive editor of the San Diego Business Journal. Let's have a nice warm welcome for Rio Carr. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. On behalf of UCSD Extension, welcome to our panel this morning, how to land a great job in today's tough job market, something all of us witness. I certainly see it in my work every day as we cover businesses in San Diego, and I talk to many people who are actively engaged in the job search. They often come and talk to me about how to find a job. Fortunately, today we actually have someone here who knows how to do that. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce you to Robin Ryan. Uh, Robin is a career counselor and best-selling author of 60 Seconds and You're Hired. She is a national speaker, a best-selling author, and her other books include Winning Resumes, Over 40, and You're Hired. I don't see anybody here over 40, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Soaring on Your Strengths. She has a busy career counseling practice, working with individuals nationwide, uh, providing job search, resume writing, interview coaching services. She has appeared on over 1,500 television shows, including Oprah and Dr. Phil and now The Rio Show. So That's right. There yes. you go. Uh, you can sign up for her newsletter, uh, and I, I've just talked to her for a little while before we uh, went on air, and I can tell you she is extremely knowledgeable, as you'll soon find out. Her uh, newsletter is called Career News You Can Use, and it's at her website, RobinRyan.com. So for the first half of the, uh, this morning's session, we're going to, uh, Robin and I are gonna talk, I'm gonna pose some questions to her, uh, and please make your questions uh, note, known, noted on your note cards, and we'll take those at the second half of the program. Robin, how tough is it to find a job today? What does it look like for, for most people uh, in terms of time, time on market, so to speak? Well, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, uh, I'm sure everybody's going to agree, it's a tough job market, and on average we're finding under 40, 6 to 8 months, over 40, 12 months to land a new professional position. So, um, now, that doesn't mean that some of you aren't going to do it in a shorter amount of time, because you are, and some are going to do it in a longer amount of time. Also, too, new graduates, um, they're finding it a little more difficult in that uh, 22 to 27 year old bracket, they are finding it very hard to find a new job too, but that might be because they're not certain what they want to do yet. Given that challenging environment, what are the key strategies you can share with us for job search? Okay, the very first one that's most important is you've got to understand how do I sell myself? And that means define what are your key strengths? How do you deliver results to an employer? And by that I mean your accomplishments, the initiative that you show. Um, for many people, they'll tell me, well, you know, I could do this or I could do that or I could do this. Well, that's not very effective when you're asking people for some assistance. Like if you're networking and they say, well, you know, what do you want to do? Well, I think I'd like to go into management or something like that. 
Okay. Well, that's not specific. But if you were to say, you know, I really want to go into project management in a technology company, then you can start asking good networking questions because the majority of jobs are in what we call the hidden job market. 80% of all jobs are not advertised formally, so you're not going to see them in the newspapers, right? That means you've got to do a lot more legwork, and that's why I think it takes a lot longer. Uh, people just don't understand the process, and they're not willing to put in the time, the energy correctly so that they can have a good outcome. And the final strategy is this. You have to believe in yourself that you've got a lot to offer an employer. And if you've been unemployed for a while, if you've been trying to change careers, this can be hard. But you still have to get a couple cheerleaders in your life that are telling you you're talented, you've got a lot to offer, and let me share a story. Okay. I had a client come in, she was 64 years old, and when I opened the door, all I saw was all this white hair, and I'm looking down, she came to the office, and I'm looking down, and I'm like, she, I'm like, okay, because she's going on a job interview. And she says, Robin, nice to meet you. And so she's telling me that she's a fundraiser. And I'm thinking, okay, 64, fundraiser. Um, she was dressed in a suit, very peppy, looked really nice. We went through our interview prep, and about 10 minutes into working with this client, I forgot that she was 64. The energy she radiated, she had ideas on how she was going to bring money to the companies that she was going to go interview for. She was vivacious and really focused on, here's what I've accomplished in the past, and I've got so much more I can accomplish in the future. So she went out, she had her interviews, and she called me and she said, Robin, we got to talk about salary negotiation because I got four job offers, okay? <laughs> This is a true story. Truth is much better than fiction. Four job offers. Okay? And so we talked about negotiating, and she took a job. She's still there. She's doing extremely well. She's been there for a year and a half, two years now, and really, really likes it. The moral of the story is her white hair didn't stop her from getting a job. Her face was very lined. She looked old. Okay, I'm going to guarantee you she looked old, okay? But the vivaciousness, the energy, the enthusiasm that she brought to her job hunt, that's the kind of attitude you got to radiate because we're looking for people that can solve problems and show initiative and enthusiasm for being there. So what role does preparation play in this? We've all, we've all prepared in the sense that we've lived a career that has gotten us to the place where we need to look for a job. How does our, prep, our specific preparation play into this? Great question. First thing, what's the job title you're looking for? Okay? You have to know the title. When someone asks you what's the job title you're looking for or what are you looking for, you've got to be able to say graphic designer, okay? or I'm looking for a project manager, or I'm an RN, I'm a nurse looking to work in a hospital. Very specific, because employers hire for specific jobs. So that's probably one of the bigger things that people don't clarify, that kind of preparation. The next thing, too, do some research on companies you want to go to work for. That's what I call the hidden job market, where you identify 20, 25 employers that you're interested in and you start looking at your network. Do you know anybody who works there? Um, you go to their websites to look at what openings they might have listed. In other words, you're being much more proactive. Your resume's got to be very targeted, very specific, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that as time goes on today. Um, and suppose there's two or three jobs. Some of you have a lot of experience, and so maybe there's two or three things you could go after. No problem but your resume targets one job title. And then you can have a second resume that targets a different job title, and that's how we deal with that. So preparing, doing your research on the companies you wanna to go to work for, and then absolutely do not walk into any job interview, do not meet any employer until you have prepared, gone through questions, written them out, prepared to answer in less than 60 seconds, 
so that you will engage the conversation, right? And there's some really tough interview questions out there, so in a while I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about those too. Because I want you to realize that there's a lot of homework to do before you ever talk to that employer. You mentioned the hidden job market, 80% of all jobs are not advertised. That's right. Let's talk a little bit more about that, because obviously that's the key for all of us. Correct. And so it comes down to networking, but let me make an ex uh, two, two suggestions. Number one, this is an alumni association, and many people are here, and you have only one thing in common, the university. UCSD is your common thread. And you can network with other people based on just the fact that you went to the same college or same university. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, you might have a professional association. And people are like, oh yeah, if I'm looking for a job, I'm going to go run out and join the Human Resources Society so that you know, I'm in my professional association if I'm looking for an HR job. But the point is, you can't just join when you're job hunting. Professional associations, you need to be networking at constantly. That means being involved, working on committees, volunteering some time. And the reason being is, as people get to know you, they start to get a, you get a reputation for your, what we call, career identity, the skills and the things you're good at. And then when somebody does have a job opening, they think about the people they know. And those you've met through your association, it's a great way for you to try to start marketing yourself. I mean, they already know you, they already like you. They call you up and say, please apply for our job. How many of you would like that? How many people would like to be called today and said, please apply for our job? Okay, the rest of the class doesn't want a job, but these guys <laughs> want a job. I'm so glad. <laughs> okay. um, this, this hidden job market, you talked about identifying companies. I think that's something that many people don't think about. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit more about that process of identifying companies, getting into the company. There's several ways you can do that. Let's say you're looking for smaller to mid-sized companies. You can go online and do some research. I'm sure that the Business Journal provides lots of information. They'll list, uh, you know, the 50 companies in this field or that field, so that's a good place to go and, that, and look at some of the resources that they have. Also too, you can go to, believe it or not, the public library and talk to a reference librarian and say, you know what, I'm looking for some small companies or mid-sized companies here in San Diego. What resource would I need to do to find that list? And I want them to be in healthcare or I want them to be in the uh, sciences, or I need them to be in you know, um, the retail area. The employer, that, that, that uh, reference librarian will go get you the employer's list. You can call them up and ask them if they can do it online. Um, all you need is a public library card, and if you don't have one, you can get one. Also too, what about the university? University has libraries here and reference librarians. So lots of ways to create those lists because smaller companies you might not have heard of. And then the last thing is ask. Ask people. Do you go to a dentist? Well, sure. What's the name of your dentist? Do you like him? Is he any good? Okay, so maybe you want to be a business manager in a clinic. And so that's the reason why you're asking about the dentist. If you're interested in working in a doctor's office, right, asking questions of other people is a great way to do it. Suppose you're interested in working in the floral industry. You could ask, where do you get your flowers? If you were going to send a beautiful bouquet, where would you go get them? Maybe you want to do wedding planning. You need brides. You know, do you know anybody who's getting married? Because they'll know all about that industry. So asking good questions gets you excellent answers. Just knowing they ask the questions is probably the key strategy that most people overlook. So let's segue from asking questions okay. to networking, which is a, 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 pl a platform, if you will, where you meet people to ask questions. Correct. Talk to us about networking and your networking tips. Okay, the, the first thing is you don't work the room, okay? So you wouldn't come and see 50, 100 people and walk around and say, you know, hi, I'm Robin, I'm looking for a job. Do you have one? 
<laughs> no? Oh, oh, excuse me. I, I'm looking for a job. Do you have one? OK, you do. Oh, my new best friend, she's got a job, you know? Um, that's not effective. So when you go to an event, try to meet two to three new people. Like if you're going to an association event like this today, any kind of uh, opportunity where you can meet people, ask questions. What do you do? That should be, if you're looking for a job, when you meet somebody new or you're at a party, any kind of social opportunity, you're sitting at a sporting event for your kids next to some people, what do you do? Huh? Because that's how you're going to hear about more companies and more job opportunities. And that's how you're going to expand your network. And it's really important to expand your network. It may seem very small, but if you ask people for referrals, do you know anybody I should talk to? I'm really interested in marine science. That's the area that I want to go into. Do you know anybody working in that area? Well, yeah, I know somebody over at SeaWorld that, that works with uh, training the uh, mammals. And so, and the big killer whale. Um, now you have a lead in because it takes a reference. It takes somebody to say, oh yeah, go and talk to them. And for most of the people here, we call it informational interviewing. These things can be five, 10 minutes. You shouldn't expect more than 15 to 20. You don't want to be a burden to anybody because believe me, they'll never want to talk to you or any other job hunter again if you get to be too demanding. But if you write out a few questions beforehand, you can ask them. Some will answer your questions via email, but ideally, talking to them on the phone works perfectly. They don't feel like they can't get rid of you if they want to, and they don't have to put like an hour aside because you came to the office. Um, if they offer for you to come to the office, terrific. But if not, those short little phone conversations are very effective. And for the young people, most of the people you're going to be talking to are older. They don't text. They don't think informational interviewing and texting that back and forth is a good way to communicate, OK? OK. Yes. Uh, I've done a networking event. I've set up an interv informational interview. I've done it over the phone. How do I use email in this whole thing to forward my job search? First place, the electronic world is changing. So we're moving away from sending a Word document. In other words, we create our, our cover letter and we will create our resume in Microsoft Word. And we're moving away from that. We're not doing that anymore. We're creating them in a Word document. We proof them. They are absolutely perfect, right? Everybody, how are they? Perfect. perfect. Thank you. And they have been proofread. Everybody say the word so you know what it means. Proofread. Thank you. OK? And we do that activity. So once it's perfect, you create it into a PDF. And the reason being is a PDF is a file that's universal, but it cannot change. So when you're sending that as an attachment, a virus isn't going to be attached to it. And when they open it, it's not going to be a problem. They're going to be able to see it just the way you want it. You'll be able to format it perfectly. So that's one of the ways we're changing. Um, also via email, too, you can ask someone, would you please forward my resume on to someone at your company? That could be the HR department. It could be the hiring manager. It could be your boss. OK, so that's the other way that we're networking. We're asking others to um, go in what we call the back door. Because in large companies, that's how you get seen. You find someone inside the organization and ask, would you please forward my resume on either to HR or to the hiring manager? And they say, sure, and they do it. That's the most effective way, because you will definitely be seen. Someone's going to open it up and actually glance at that resume and cover letter. So that's a key strategy every single one of you should strive to do if possible. OK, let's, since you talked about uh, the changing uh, world of job search, let's talk a little bit about social media. OK. Should I put my picture up on Facebook and say, hey, I'm looking for a job? Should I tweet to everyone I know that I'm looking for a job? How do I lo use LinkedIn? OK. Uh, let me just say. Twitter is for people who are famous, right? Mm -hmm. So that means Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, those kinds of people. Most of us uh, do not have a million followers because we are not a music rock star. Mm -hmm. And so it is not a good job hunting tool. Facebook is to socialize with your friends, OK? Now, 
sometimes younger people will put up that they're job hunting or they're looking. Better to use it to look through the list and say to someone, where do you work? And send them a, a message. But the most effective tool, social media, is LinkedIn. And I highly recommend everybody use it. And here's why. Recruiters, internal recruiters, these are people that work in the HR department and their job is to go out and recruit and get good quality people to apply for the jobs that they have available. And so they will look at your profile. That means you go to LinkedIn, you create a profile that has what I call good keywords. Those keywords need to say things about you and your accomplishment. So a keyword would be something like um, research scientist in biomedical engineering. All right. So it's a job title and it's an industry. Now, some of you may not be industry specific. That's fine. But be very specific and try to put in as many keywords as you can um, because they're going to search these things. So it needs to be searchable. You, you don't put your whole resume on there, but you look at what were my key accomplishments at that job, and you list two or three. When we're going backwards, because some of you are more mature workers, we don't uh, create big paragraphs for jobs that we had 25 years ago, okay? Employers are interested in what you've done in the last five to seven years. Okay, they're thinking that you're moving progressively, that your career is moving ahead. Um, for many of you, the next job is going to be a promotion. It's not going to be what you've done in the past, but you're showing that you're promotable. You show a lot of initiative, which means you've laced LinkedIn, just like your resume, with your accomplishments and the results you've achieved. Think about it this way. Problem, what was your action, and what was the result? And employers hire for results, so you want to make sure your LinkedIn talks about the best results you got at whatever job you had. And then build that network. Try to find anybody that you know, ask them to be a part of your network, because there's access to people in companies and organizations that can help you, of course, send your resume in. So we're online now with LinkedIn. Let's stay online for a minute. Okay. Talk to us about some websites that you recommend that we look at. As I said in the beginning, First, create your list of 20 to 25 companies you're interested in and go to their website so that you can read about, are they doing any expansion, are they growing? And then look to see, do they list their own job opportunities? Almost every company now does that because it's free. Free is good as far as the company is concerned. Also, typically, um, unless it's a very, very large, you know, magnet type of organization, it will get uh, looked at. So that's the first thing. Um, the, other, the other websites that I really like and I recommend to my clients to use, Indeed.com, Indeed, I-N-D-E-E-D.com. -E Excellent website. It's easy to search. Um, and simplyhired.com, simplyhired.com. That's the other ones. Those two are the two I pretty much use exclusively with my clients besides going to companies' websites. And the most popular one of all, Monster, I never use. Mm -hmm. It's very ineffective. And I've been very disappointed with career builders, so I've stopped using that. And also, um, most of the newspapers are picked up and placed inside Indeed and Simply Hired. They pick up newspapers, associations, uh, companies. They're what we call sweep sites, and they actually go out and sweep. Um, but one key tip, do not rely on the alert system. Alert means every time you've got a new job for a you know, English teacher, they're going to send you an email. It's not always perfect. Um, they don't put a lot of money into that part and that feature. So I tell my clients, you go and you search once a week because you will find opportunities that you'll never get an alert for. So that's a strategy that you should all implement. Okay, we've talked a little bit about how to, what to do. Let's talk a little bit about what not to do. We learn more from our mistakes sometimes and our successes. Tell us about some of the big mistakes people make when they're in job search. They don't know the job title they're looking for. Because if you don't know that job title, you can't network very well. So that means you're going you're gonna to eliminate the most effective way to find a job. 
Their resume is very general. Um, the older workers tell me, well, I put everything I've ever done in there because, you know, when they're looking through it, they might see something I did before and then they'll want to hire me. Or I'll, I'll mail it in to a job that's not, they're asking for a marketing director and you're mailing it in and you are not even in marketing or sales, you're in accounting. But they're like, well, they'll see me, right? Uh, it doesn't work that way. Most of your resumes go into an electronic database and they search the database based on keywords. So it's a very big mistake not to have a very targeted resume, very specific, no more than two pages. I repeat myself, no more than two pages. If you've graduated in the last five years, absolutely no more than one page. You haven't accomplished much more than that, okay? And we don't need to know every class you've taken in college and graduate school. So um, you want, those are a couple key things. The other thing too is it comes to the job interview. People show up and are dressed so inappropriately. USA Today yesterday asked um, for hiring managers, for the ages of 18 to 24, what's the biggest mistake they make? And 50% said inappropriate dress. And I'll tell you, if you're over 40, you're the worst offenders. <laughs> yeah. It, and so you have to dress professionally. You want to dress up. Dress to impress. Okay? We know you can dress down. We know it's casual. I know it's Southern California and people don't wear suits. But guess what? Those that get hired do. So that's a very good strategy. Ladies, you can wear a suit with a nice blazer or a sweater. Um, but gentlemen, <clears throat> suit, shirt, tie, OK? And not a neon tie either. Um, <laughs> the point being is you want to be able to show them that you're going to be able to go to an important meeting. You can go out to a conference and represent your company, and they won't be embarrassed looking at you. Let's talk resume for a minute. OK. How about a, one or two ideas that are really going to make my resume stand out? OK, I've got a secret. And 95% of the general population, that's professionals, everybody, never uses it. It's called a summary of qualifications section. And this is what it entails. It is four to six sentences that briefly describes your background, experience and strongest skills to do the job. So it might start out saying something like um, proven track record with six years of uh, credit management experience overseeing a staff of 10. If you're looking for a credit manager that's got a supervised staff, how many people are paying attention? Everybody. Because you just told me in that one sentence that you can do the job. And if we're searching these fast, and I'm sorry to say, the typical resume, when it's viewed, gets a 15 to 20 second glance. Okay? And so it is critical that you use this summary of qualification. I never write a resume without it. I've written more than 5,000 resumes. I see my clients get interviews all the time. I know it's effective. Most career counselors teach it. We know it's effective, but yet, most people don't. Um, the thing that's not effective is to do the bullet laundry list of all the skills that you think you have. Um, employers don't like that at all. They can also tell that the words are not connected to a sentence, too. And that'll automatically sometimes get you kicked out. So those are some things to think about. OK, that's very helpful. Um, we're coming to the end of this section. And I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about cover letters in the electronic world. What role do they play, if any? People think they don't need one anymore. How many people think that now you don't, because you're just sending in your resume, you don't need one anymore? You absolutely need a terrific cover letter. Right? And you need to take the time to make it specific, targeted to the job you're applying for. And that opening sentence summarizes the skills and the experience you bring to the job. Hone in immediately. Highlight some of your experience by using bullets that relate to some of the top skills they're asking for. 
People don't write cover letters. They don't uh, want to take the time. And the worst offense, Rio, is they use the generic one. Oh, I'm writing for a job I saw on your website, la da la da la da la da. And it has very little relevance to what we've advertised. Um, the worst thing also, too, in a cover letter, never tell them how much money you're looking for, okay? They don't want to know and they're going to kick you out if you just volunteer that without even being asked. <laughs> one last question, job interviewing technique. Oh, yes. Give me your best one. In 60 seconds when you're hired, the thing that I write about that distinguishes you, we go back to how do you sell yourself. I call it the 60 second sell. Think of this as your verbal business card. You identify for the job that you're gonna go interview for, what are my top five selling points? You link them together in a couple sentences and then you have this verbal business card. So when you go into that job interview and they say, tell me about yourself, you don't start out with, well, I was born in Oklahoma and I went to college in Kansas and then I came out to California and I went to graduate school and got a certificate here at, in San Diego and 25 minutes later, you're talking about your experience. Because if you can't engage them in the first 60 seconds, you will lose them. They don't have big intention spans. Employers can sit there ask you questions for 30 minutes and not listen to a word that you've said. So engaging them quickly, which is what the 60 second sell does. And so tell me about yourself. Well, I've got five years of experience doing internet uh, marketing. And specifically, I've been working on retail products such as the kind you have here. Immed immediately they're engaged. The other thing that the 60 second sell is used for, Rio, is to close the interview. So when you're all done, and they've told you when they're going to call, and you've done all that, and you say thank you, your final words are this. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Let me summarize for you, in closing, what I think I can bring to the job. And you hit them with those five top selling points, that 60 second sell. You shake their hand, you're out the door. Because the last thing that the employer is going to do is they're going to write some notes about you. They're going to make, you know, oh, she had glasses and she said she could do this and oh, yeah, she was good at that or he could do this. Um, when you interview four or five people in the course of the day, it's hard to remember very much. But they'll take notes on what you just said. And that's very, very effective. And I will tell you this, hardly anybody does it, but it's very impressive. And, and it really works in persuading the employer that you can do that job and they should consider and hire you. With that, that closes this portion of our uh, morning's program. Let's give Robin Ryan a warm thank you. for her thank good you words. Very much. Thank you. All right, these are your questions. I have quite a few. We'll get through them as quickly as we can. Thank you very much for that. And also for printing large, I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, question. I want to move into a new industry. How do I make the jump into a new job without starting at an entry level position? Ooh, good question. Um, I guess the first question that I would say is, have you gotten new training? What makes you qualified to go into this new industry? Because that's the thing the employer is gonna be interested in. Secondarily, look at what we call your transferable skills. Those are things that you're really good at. For example, maybe your organizational skills are terrific, or maybe you've done a lot of writing or a lot of public speaking, and those are related skills. What about your computer skills? These are skills you can take and transfer from one job to the other. Maybe you've managed people in the past, so you're able to coach and mentor people. These are the types of things that when you're moving into a new industry, you want to talk about. That way you don't start at the bottom. And I would highly recommend you don't want to, okay? You'd be bored out of your mind and the salary would be awful and you'll be miserable. So looking at transferable skills and the best way to see how do they fit is really talk to people working in the new industry, doing the new job you want to do so that you can understand what skills I have from the past really apply and then tell them about them. Okay, would you elaborate 
on why a laundry list of skills would be ineffective compared to the paragraph form you described a few minutes ago and a summary of qualifications. Yes. Um, when an employer looks at a resume, and just so that everybody's on the same page as me, we have our name and our address and our phone number and our email, and that email, of course, is not sexykitten.com, right? You know, it is, you know, something about your name and a Gmail account. Um, and it's not a company website either, unless you're applying internally. So um, then you have your job title and the summary of qualifications. That summary of qualifications gets read. The old fashioned style of where you put all the skills because you're hoping somebody's gonna see all those things, it doesn't tell me any results, okay? We're not interested in a laundry list. We're interested in results. What kind of problems did you solve in the past? So that's the difference, and that's where the summary becomes much more effective. Uh, here's a question about interviewing. Okay. What interview questions most commonly trip people up? What, what do they fall Oh, on? gold star to whoever asked that one. Situation questions. Okay, and that's one of the things I talk a lot about because a situation question is describe a time, explain to us uh, a specific situation. So tell us about, describe a time, give us an example. We are looking for you to tell us something very specific, such as give me an example um, of a difficult coworker that you've had to work with. Okay. Describe your worst boss. Ooh, now, some people want to vent because they want to say, look it, you know, they were an idiot. That person, you know, that person was an idiot, didn't know anything, I did all the work, and he would take credit for all my work, blah, blah, blah. Um, that hiring manager starts thinking, not, you know, oh, it's too bad you were a victim. They start thinking, oh, well, this is what that person's going to be saying about me. They're going to be telling everybody I'm an idiot, you know, when they leave here. So. A cardinal rule is don't talk negatively about an employer. And it may be hard, tell your friends, tell you know, your parents, tell your mom, your sister, your cat, I don't care. Just don't tell the employers. Um, so the strategy is on these questions, they are very hard questions. I'll give you one that a Fortune 500 company uses all the time. Describe how you've worked in a diverse environment and how that plays into your career. Now, can you answer that one sitting there at the top of your head without thinking about it? You're going to have to. So going out, researching, you know, in 60 Seconds You're Hired, we ask a lot of questions. You need to sit down with a pen and paper and write out the answers to those questions. You need to write out good examples. If you are a manager, you will get asked, how do you motivate your team? How do you deal with the coworker that's not doing what they're supposed to? Right? What do you do when you, know, when you have this problem or that problem? So you're, they're going to be looking for specific answers. And they're going to judge you based on what you've done in the past. Because employers believe if you've done it in the past for someone else, you're likely to continue behaving that way in the future. OK, we have a couple questions about LinkedIn. OK. First, how important are recommendations on LinkedIn? You know everyone is recommending right, one yeah. another. Right, um, yeah. If you're looking to get hired as an individual consultant, right, or you're selling services, very important. But if you are looking to get a job, not as important because you're going to provide real references when you go into that job interview of three people you've worked with in the past that they can talk to. And how important are those references? Critical. Talk okay. about that a little bit, please. Yeah. Uh, such a mistake people make. They don't think about what are people going to say. So if you had a bad relationship with one boss, don't list them. <laughs> Give someone else from that organization. Maybe it was someone in a different department. Maybe it was the boss's boss. Someone that's going to talk positively about your work. The other thing, too, we know lots of people have gotten laid off. That's not uncommon. All right, so you may feel like it's the kiss of death and no one's going to hire you, but employers don't see that that way. They're looking at what is your talent, and they want to talk to people who have managed you before, people you have worked with. If you're in sales, they'll want to talk to a customer or two. So keep in mind when you're offering those three recommendations, it's not the mayor because you happen to know him. 
It has to be somebody that you've worked with, preferably they've been a supervisor in a supervisory role that, that can talk about the work you do. Another LinkedIn question. Uh, I have a few resumes targeted for a few job titles. How would I showcase the one I, I want to highlight on LinkedIn, in the LinkedIn profile? Okay, so the answer to that question is that person needs to do some career counseling and sit down and look at the marketplace, do some research, what kind of job opportunities are out there. It's wonderful if you want to do something, but there's only four jobs in the entire United States that's not too likely that you're going to get one. So on LinkedIn, you can really only market yourself to do one kind of job title because at the top you have to give a job title. And I'd say, Take the research, look at all the opportunities, and then make a decision. You know, I'm going to try to go for this for a month or two. If it doesn't work, then I'm going to switch it out. Give us a couple key tips on following up after the interview in the electronic age. Do we send letters? Do we send emails? Oh, yes. Carrier pigeon? What, <laughs> what do we use? Okay. People actually should write a handwritten thank you note. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. Handwritten, that means pen, paper, on a little thank you note, and you send it that says, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you. Um, I really think your company would benefit from my blank, blank, and blank experience or my blank, blank, and blank skills that I'd be able to apply. And, you know, another little, you know, plus about why you'd like to do the job, but primarily what you can bring to the position and thanking them for the opportunity. If you sit on the edge, it's between you and somebody else. What employers tell me all the time is this. The thank you note convinces them you want the job more. And there is a perception that if you want it more, you'll do a better job for them. Okay? Um, the other thing that they are looking for, too, is they don't want somebody who just wants a job. They want somebody who's going to excel in the job that they have. So be sure you're interviewing for the appropriate positions and that you're thanking them. Emails don't count. Um, someone like me gets five to 600 emails a day. I mean, we click, 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 click through them. You can't read them all, right? And so emails don't count. The best way to be able to send a thank you note is this little tip. When you're interviewing with the people, ask for their business card. And that's how you'll know how to address it and spell their name right and send it to them. If there's people in the panel, ask everybody. A couple of questions uh, about resumes. Sure. First, uh, how do I deal with a gap in my resume and or how do I handle being fired uh, on my resume or in an application? Okay. So. Um, we never ever use the word fired, okay? We never use the word fired. Take it out of your vocabulary. And a gap is a big deal to you, but not to an employer. Since 2008, so many people have been laid go. So many people have been laid off. They don't see that as the biggest issue. But what is an issue is what you do with the time. Oh, well, I was playing video games, or I was taking care of my kids, or I was, oh, the worst one of all, well, I was looking for a job and it's such an awful job market. You have no idea, don't lose your job, it's so terrible out there, okay, uh-uh. They wanna know that you've done some things to be current. You know, I've studied up on the industry, I've gone to some conferences, uh, I've been reading a lot of journals, I read a lot of articles in relation to the industry. They wanna know that you've kept in touch with the skill set. I go to my association, I've been active there. And maybe many of you have volunteered, okay? That volunteer experience can be very important. For many people, they actually get management jobs real because they volunteered and got management experience. They never had any before. And that volunteer work is credible, relevant, and should be on that resume. Talk about pictures. Uh, since we're in an electronic age, do we put pictures on our resume? What about the picture on LinkedIn? Okay, let's do the resume and then we'll do LinkedIn. Okay. Okay. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and here's why. Um, first place, it probably won't transfer electronically. And you'd have to worry that your whole resume would get dumped because the picture might interfere with the words. And what people do is they, they draw lines on their resumes, they make boxes. All of this stuff can make your resume impossible for the scanning machine, the electronic scanners, to see. 
So you don't want a fancy resume. You just want it you know, clean, easy to read, but no decorations, and certainly not a Kodak moment. Now, LinkedIn is different. LinkedIn, we want an engaging smile. Business casual is kind of the way people would dress, but if we were a doctor, like an MD, or if we are a lawyer, certain pos positions like that, probably in a business suit. Um, smiling and engaging. You want to look friendly. When I see your face, I want to think, oh, I'd like to talk to that person, okay? So um, try to get a better picture than what the iPhone will take. Okay, I'm not saying that it's bad, but uh, a plain background, um, and it's a headshot only. So, you know, really pay attention to what's this picture going to look like. And if you're an older, more mature person, spend a little time on the makeup, make sure you've got a contemporary hairstyle so that you look attractive and appealing to the employer. Or they won't call you. I'm writing a cover letter for a job. Should I reference the job posting in the cover letter if I'm responding to a specific yes. job? Yes, and here's how I do that. I do um, my address, and then I do the words RE, dot, dot, and I put the job title, so it would be um, you know, scientific investigator, right? And it might say job number and actually list the number. So it is very clear right there the specific job I'm applying for. Typically, you're sending it in, but sometimes things get messed up. I don't know about you, but you know the HR person, think about the person who's got a whole bunch of resumes, walks, and trips, and now they're all mixed up, right? And so you want your cover letter to be able to stand on its own, and you want that resume to stand on its own, and they got to be filled with results and very targeted, or you won't pass the 15-second glance. Let's talk a little bit about people who are employed mm -hmm. and oh, wanting yes. to uh, advance in their existing career. That's a, that's a fantastic question because um, when we talk about job hunting, if you are an internal employee, you oftentimes forget that you need to look at where's my next move and what do I have to do to get there? What kind of training might I need to get there? Um, where, what skills do I need to, to expand? Sometimes you go to your boss and say, you know, I really enjoy doing training. Could I lead our meetings? Can I be the one that organizes them, does the agenda, and actually leads the meetings? Boss probably say, sure, go ahead. It's one less thing I don't have to do. Um, so it's your initiative that oftentimes gets you extra experience. Going and joining committees internally so other people get to know you and get to know what you're doing. Asking for 15 minutes of somebody's time because they're doing a job you'd really like to do if you want to move on to that. Or if you're going to move on to a bigger area or a different area. Typically, too, unless the company's very, very small, the new managers aren't going to know you. So you want to make sure that you're meeting as many people as you possibly can, that you can learn about what kind of job opportunity is so you can be very prepared when you go in the interview. You research it and you write out your answers to those questions. You put as much effort as possible in because you're talking about initiative to move up. And they base that on what potential do you have? How do you think? How do you write? How do you react? How do you get along with people? What kind of collaboration do you do? What kind of problems have you been solving? All of that gets summed up to, yeah, this seems like the right person to put in that role. How do we talk about our salary history effectively? <gasps> My favorite question, salary. I just love those, because uh, everybody messes them up. First place, if the employer puts in the ad, send salary history, don't do it, okay? Best advice I can give you. The most effective time to negotiate salary is after you've been offered the job. Now, some employers are nasty, and they write down, if you don't tell us your salary history, we're not going to consider you. So here's my strategy for that. Go and research on like Payscale or Salary.com and research, for my job title, what's the average range that this job should pay? And then under salary history saying, according to Payscale.com, 
a middle manager with this much experience should be in the, you know, $75,000 to $105,000 range, and I'm within that range. You've got a very broad range. They're not going to kick you out because you're too low. They're not going to kick you out because you're too high. And many of you will sell yourselves very short. I uh, did a, do a survey and asked employers, why do you ask, you know, send salary history? And they said, 24% said, hey, we use it as a way to screen people out. Not because they were too high, but because their salary was too low. And what, we, what the employer then says, oh, well, they can't be as good as they're saying. They must be lying. They're exaggerating their skill set. And that may be because your employer didn't pay you well. That's why you're looking for a new job. So salary history, tricky. And you want to get to the point where they really want you. Once you've gone through that interview and they decide you're the one for the job, that is when we have the most power to negotiate. Okay, I've had several questions about moving from one industry to another. Okay. How do we package our skills to make them transferable? What should we do? When you're trying to change industries, you've got to become knowledgeable about the new industry, go to association meetings and some conferences. Um, every so every, every job out there has an association, and every association has conferences. And the reason being is you need to learn as much as you can about the new industry so that you'll be able to say some of the buzzwords, so that you'll be able to understand some of the problems and issues and show how your skills can relate. Also, too, sell yourself as a fresh perspective. You've been hiring a lot of people to solve your problems the same way, and you're not getting the results you want. I bring a fresh perspective. I bring some different ideas, some different strategies, some different ways to do some things differently that have been effective in where I was before, and I believe they'd be effective for you, Mr. or Ms. Employer. Job interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recommend that people uh, participate in as many job interviews as possible? even if they don't have a chance for the job, even if it may not be the perfect job, just so they get the experience? No, <laughs> I do not. Because I believe in practicing before you go. Okay. So I believe in role playing with another professional, a manager if you can. Um, sometimes in your own organization, a manager or an HR person would, would uh, work with you and do a little role playing um, before you go on for that promotion. You want to practice answering those questions. You want to say them out loud to another person so they can say, you know what, you're always like playing with your hair, or I don't have a pen. But this is what people do, they tap the pen. They move the pen around. They get fidgety. It's very distracting. So when you're talking to another person, they're going to tell you that. The other thing people do is when they get asked an interview question, they do this. Um, well, let me see. Um, yeah, I, I have had a lot of experience doing that, blah, blah, blah. There is no answer on your shoes, no answer on the ceiling, and no answer on the wall. And when you don't have that engaged eye contact with the employer, it feels like you don't know what you're talking about. You aren't confident, so then you don't make me feel confident that you can do the job. Those are important things that you got to kind of keep in mind. So practicing before you go. You shouldn't have to have 100 interviews, OK? If, if you're that bad at interviewing, hire a career counselor, go to the university, get, take a career class on interview coaching so that you'll get better at it. But by practicing with another professional before you go and writing out your answers and preparing examples of past work, those are key tips on how to be effective when you sit in front of that employer. Any tips on practicing negotiating skills? Anything you've written? Any books you'd recommend besides your own? I've written 60 Seconds and You're Hired, and it has a lot on negotiations. You can find articles on RobinRyan.com about negotiations. There's a lot of free information out there. The biggest thing is do the research. What's the range that this job is going to pay? Ask them if, if they offer you the job, too, sometimes you can ask human resources, do you have a complete job description? And oftentimes it tells you what the salary range is right there. So you want to know what that range is so you can be within that range. And sometimes if they offer you, let's just use a, a round figure, let's say they offer us $80,000. And you were hoping for 83 or 84, you'd be thrilled if you got that. You might say to them, well, 
it seemed to me that within the range, you know, I was in the more of the mid range to the higher range. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about the skills I'm bringing you and reiterate, what do they get by hiring you? How can you come get up to speed really fast and start making a contribution? And then say, you know, can you, um, is, is there a way we can talk about this? Is there uh, anything you can do? And oftentimes they'll come back with four or 5,000 more. So not only would you have gotten um, what you'd hoped for, but another 1,000 or two. So asking typically makes it richer for you. Usually puts somewhere between $500 to $1,000 more in your paycheck by negotiating the salary. OK, last question. Sure. Job search is often a very lonely pursuit. You're often yes. working at home. Right. You don't have a network. What, what kind of a network should you build for yourself in terms of friends, family, associates who can help you through that process? What do you okay. recommend? Um, a lot of associations actually have a job search group that you can go to. But the things that I recommend the most is, number one, have a cheerleader. Okay, that can be a friend, it can be your mother, it can be anybody you designate, but it's an enthusiastic person that says, you know what, you're fantastic. They'll send you an email, they'll call you and give you a pep talk, right, when things are slow, and they will be slow. Okay, it's not going to be speedy. It's not going to be instantaneous. This is not instantaneous gratification. Um, I'd like it to be that for you, but it's probably not going to be. So you need that cheerleader to keep your spirits up. Um, ask a friend, can you send me an email every morning so I see it and say, you know, you're a terrific uh, at this, right? Or you're terrific at that. You're an amazing web designer, or you're amazing at system analysis, or you're an amazing engineer. Whatever it is, just to kind of keep you pumped up and going, right? Then you need a job search friend. Somebody else who's job hunting, preferably in a different area from you. Okay? Because that way you don't feel like you're competing with the jobs. And if they see something or know somebody or, or whatever, they can tell you about it and vice versa. And you can go have coffee and just talk about the job search process and, you know, what's working and what's not. What books did you read? What resources did you find? You know, um, what did you do on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. Because it's a process and processes take time. I will tell you this. Employers are hiring so many more people now than they were a year ago. So the job market's improving. It's not fabulous, but it's improving. But there's a great job out there, and you only need one. Keep that in mind. You're only looking for one fit, OK? So if you can focus on, I only need one. I only need one job for me. That's all I need, OK? It's going to be an easier process and an easier time. Thank you, Rob and Ryan. Let's thank give you Robin all. a warm oh, round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.